in one place. So with that, um, I will pass it over to Mamata, uh, who will share some best practices around using felt. Okay, uh, thank you, Anya. And I'm just going to share my screen. Is that okay for everybody? Can you see it okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, like Anya said, thank you so much for joining us. This is our first inaugural event and we're super excited um, that we have you as our community and that you've been enjoying felt and um, creating some awesome maps with it. Uh, as Anya also mentioned, uh, I do cartography at felt. So um, that kind of entails a variety of things. I work on our base maps. I work on our um, data library layers, styling workflows. And um, one of my favorite things to do, which is make maps, I do that as well. And I've been doing online cartography for uh, quite some years. And I have to say that uh, felt is um, the most fun I've had making um, maps on the web. Uh, cartography is just one piece of this awesome tool that y'all have been using. So I just want to give a shout out to um, all of my colleagues that you see here. Some are um, on this call. And if you feel comfortable and would like to, anybody in this picture, please uh, just do a Zoom wave. Uh, okay, so today um, I'm just going to walk through how I created uh, this map and keeping with the fall theme. Um, this is a map that I made to kind of have a fall aesthetic, but really the purpose of it is for me to be able to share it um, more broadly so people can start um, start adding information about great fall walks and uh, fall foliage around the city of Denver where um, I'm joining you from today. So with this, we'll go through a few um, high level things, which, or I'm gonna give a high level overview of the things that we're going to go through. So we'll look at how to uh, style layers. So basically data that you upload to felt um, in a couple of different ways using our uh, style editor and then going over into our advanced editor um, to, to do some modifications. Um, we'll look at, the utility of uh, the curated layers that are offered uh, through felt and how they can really um, enhance your map and add additional context. Um, we'll also look at one of my favorite features, uh, which is the ability to clip layers and uh, data layers and bring them to the foreground as elements and the different interactions that you can do um, with that workflow. Um, and then, and then we'll look at how to use other elements to really bring your map to life. How do you add photos and how do you um, do some of the annotations and drawings and uh, other things. And uh, finally, we will look at different ways to share your map with the world. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to exit out of this. And Okay, so this is where we're going to start. Um, I have this map here where I've added uh, three data sets from the city of Denver. Um, the points are trees in the four largest parks in the city. Um, this is a, the lines are a trails data set, um, specifically recreation type trails, and um, the polygons are uh, Denver neighborhoods. Um, Okay, so, and I should say that if, in case you haven't added uh, data yet, it, I added this data um, through this upload anything option that you can see down here in the toolbar. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna start with is uh, styling these points. And like we saw in the final map, uh, these, these trees are kind of colored with a fall aesthetic. And so um, I'll show you how I did that. Uh, so. The first thing I like to do just to see what kind of uh, attributes have come over with data is to um, look at the view data, which, oops, which is the tabular form. For those of you familiar with geographic data, you know what an attribute table is. So this is basically the attribute table that uh, lists all of the different attributes that I have available to me to use uh, for styling. So in this case, I did some reading of the metadata and know that this uh, species 
underscore CO is actually the common species. And that's the attribute that I want to use to um, make a categorical map. So to get started with the map, I will go to our style editor. And um, I'm going to just fill in some basic details here. So this, uh, this title basically overwrites my um, the default title that came in when I uploaded the data. Um, I want to make a color by category map. And as we saw, the attribute I want to use is, uh, is the species CO. And what we do is we alphabetize all of the attributes. So um, that's a good way to find what you're looking for. Um, in this case, I'm not going to label the trees. So I can turn labels off. And um, OK, so now I have a categorical map of tree types in these four parks in Denver. But I want to um, talk a little bit about this and then see how we apply some of the fall styles. So what, what is also interesting about how we do this is I can tell something from um, my data already. I can we return the top 10, 10 categories um, within a categorical attribute. So the first thing is that these are the most common tree types within these uh, four parks in the city. Um, and then by default, our drawing order uh, will place the one with the least records on top. So that's really helpful too. So your data don't, so features that are less don't get covered up by features um, that are more. Okay, so for this kind of fall aesthetic um, from the color palette picker here, I'm going to choose this palette at the very bottom because it has kind of the most fall colors and apply that. And the other thing I can do with the legend, which is great, is um, I can adjust any of these colors directly from here. So this brings up all of the available colors from the palette that I've chosen, and I can um, apply them as I want. So I know that the, like I put on the uh, fall map, the majority of uh, colors in Denver are in this uh, kind of yellow to orange range. So I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of these that are darker and uh, choose a color that's a little more yellow, orangish. I do know the, the flowering crab apple is more on the reddish pink side. Um, so yeah, so that kind of gives me, this gives me a quick way to be able to um, change my category colors. Okay. So that's great. Now we have, we're getting started with this map. And that's a, so those are basically the um, settings that I want to use for, from the uh, style editor. And next I want to go into the advanced editor to, to do some more refinement. So I can access the advanced editor from down here where it says advanced. And um, what comes up is everything that I had uh, populated here. Um, is now populated in uh, what we call our uh, felt style language, um, which is a way to basically uh, write the style of your map um, using, a, uh, using this visualization grammar. So uh, there's, so in this config section here, I have all of the top 10 categories that were um, returned with my data. Uh, since I just want to give the fall aesthetic. I'm going to remove the uh, spruce category. Um, and I'm just going to actually close this so you can see what happens. So that just got removed from the legend. And then I'm going to remove this, uh, these pines as well. I don't really want um, the others on there again, just because this is for aesthetic purposes. So here I can set this property show other um, to false. And uh, remove this other property, which determines the drawing order of my other category. Um, since we're not showing them, we don't need that. So I'm just going to uh, delete that. And there we go. Now I just have the uh, deciduous trees that will actually be changing colors. Um, and next I wanna go down to this uh, style block. And this basically defines um, the, the style that we see on the map. Um, one of the cool things that you can do with the felt style language is do some um, multi-scale uh, styling across different properties. So 
for example, in this case, I want to um, vary my size of the point symbols from uh, 2 to 10 um, as I zoom in and out so they get smaller and larger. Um, I don't want to have a stroke on these, so I can set that to 0. And um, just to get a little bit of a blended effect, I'm going to um, change the opacity to 0 0.8. Okay, and then I will click done to get out of uh, the advanced editor. And there we go. So now we have this map kind of looking more like fall. Um, the next layer I wanna style are these uh, recreation trails. And these are meant more for kind of to be background information. And I can quickly style them um, in the, in the uh, style editor. So these will just all be the same color. Um, I'm gonna, the style I wanna choose is one of these uh, available styles here, dashed. And then I'm gonna decrease the uh, width of the line and then choose like a darker gray just to push them back a little bit. And then um, again, just like adjust some of this opacity so they sit in the background a little more. Another thing you can do with the legend is you can um, change the title of the different legend items. So in this case, I know that these are trails that are uh, paved and unpaved. So I'm just gonna update that there and click done. And now we have um, the trails. And then finally, uh, Denver is definitely a city where people refer to um, where they are based on neighborhoods. So I would just, also want to do a quick style on these um, polygons. And I do want to label these, so I'm going to keep the neighborhood name and choose this uh, brighter purple color, except adjust the style to be more of this boundary style. And I want my, um, I want these boundaries to be associated with their labels. So they all kind of sit on the same visual plane. And so I can just select the option to use color. And there we go. So. So now we have the base um, that we can start working from. One of the things that is helpful for this specific map is if I had uh, more indication of where all of these parks were in the city. Um, you know, we've highlighted some with the trees, but uh, I'm going to go to the data library here and search for parks. And we have a layer called local parks sourced from um, OpenStreetMap that shows uh, parks all around the world. So now that has just in instantaneously provided more context um, for my map. OK, so next is um, looking at how we can do uh, what I said was one of my favorite things, which is clip. So I um, have a friend and she told me about uh, this loop right here at one of the largest park city park. And I want to um, highlight that as one of the walks people should take to see fall colors. So if I click on it, you'll see it gets highlighted and then I can um, click on these scissors. And what that does is it now clips from the data and bring, brings it to um, an element. Um, and now I have some different operations that I can do um, on this element. The first thing is I just wanna change, uh, all of the paths on this map are gonna be blue. Um, I think it's interesting to see the distance so I can um, select this and there is a setting to do it in, um, in metric units as well. And then, uh, also, what's really cool is all of the attributes that were in the original trail data set have now um, come over to this element. So I can go through these and, you know, if I don't want some of them or if I want to keep some, modify, um, modify their title or anything like that, I can do that. Okay, so next, um, I want to add a photo. So similar to what um, you did when you were putting the fall colors on the map, I'm gonna use um, the pin tool and just put a pin around here. And uh, and she said that uh, colors, colors are starting to change. So I can put that as my uh, pin, uh, pin label. And then um, since it's a, since it is a photo, I'm going to use this um, camera icon and uh, 
oops, sorry. I'm like getting a little bit. Okay. Um, oops. Yeah. Use that. And then I'm going to go up to upload an image. And this one is city park. And so now anytime anybody clicks on the camera icon, they can see the uh, photo. And I also want people to add the date that they saw this. And this was last weekend. So here I can just put in October um, 7th, 2022. And I could add any other uh, details that I want associated with that element. Okay, so to just quickly show that again, clip where you're interested. You can change the color, add some distance, modify any of the details. Since I already have this camera icon up here and it has um, the information that I want associated with it, I can just copy and paste it, put it down here. And this time uh, reds are popping and um, I can choose the option to replace the image and then um, chose one of uh, choose my part. Okay, so I, um, I live around this area of the city and I went to uh, Sloan's Lake the other day and I took some photos with my phone and they have a location attached to them. So what I can do is um, get those, oops, <laughs> I can uh, get those and I can just drag, uh, drag and drop them uh, onto the map. And if they have location information associated with them, I get that notification and felt, and then I can click move to location and they all get placed, which is really um, nice. So I'm sure you can imagine many use cases for uh, this kind of, um, geolocated photos. I can also do other things. I know that there's a, a, a old grove stand of cottonwoods here that have um, beautiful yellows. Um, and if I want to, if I want to uh, get this kind of pointed here, there's, you know, different things that you, that I, that I, and you all in the maps that we've seen like to do with um, elements to be creative and add more information to this map. Um, and then there could also be the case where uh, one of the trails that somebody has gone on isn't actually on this map. So let's say I took, a, um, I can use the route tool to trace a, a bike route that I've taken. Um, and let's say I did this route here and I'm just gonna uh, change the color so it's purple. If I want, I could put the distance again. Um, and then, you know, just get a little, I also want to put the colors there and I don't have a photo because I was on my bike. So I could use other drawing tools like the highlighter and just kind of cycle through um, adding some color here um, based on what I observed while I was on my um, bike ride. And, this this bike path is now behind. So if I select that, I can just um, bring it to the front. Okay, so now I feel like this map is pretty much ready for um, me to share. One of the things I also like to do is maybe, you know, the neighborhoods are more contextual, so we can uh, hide those. And even if you don't want all of the trails and sidewalks on, you can hide different um, layers on your map and that will be preserved when you share it. So um, sometimes I like to do that. In this case, we'll keep it as is. And I, if I go up to the share, we'll see all of the different options that I have. Um, so the first is if I was working with Rachel and Anya on this map that, um, and I needed them to do some editorial work on it, or if I just wanted their opinion and wanted to get their feedback, I could um, share it with them via email and, uh, and use, oops, at felt, and uh, set her to editor. So there's two options here, either an editor or a viewer. So this is a great setting to share maps um, internally. Uh, by default, this is uh, 
this map can be viewed by anybody, whether they're logged into Felt or not. And since this is a collaborative map, I want to allow public um, editing. So basically anybody with a Felt account can um, open this map up and start adding their own information. Sorry. Okay, and then there's two other um, ways to share. If you wanna post your map on uh, Twitter or something like that, you can use this uh, link option. And we have two options here, which is link to the whole map, which will be the extent of uh, all of your data and your elements, or you could link to uh, a very specific view. So in this case, if I just wanna link to the current view, I can select that copy that link. And then when um, that's opened, it will open up to what to what we see right now. If I want to post this on a, a website inside of a blog or any other um, any other place where you can embed a map, um, there's different embed options here where we have large, medium, small for the size and uh, and you could also do a custom one more specific to the size that you need. And if I copy this, I'll get the HTML um, embed code. And that is a quick tour of how to make this uh, fall themed map in felt. And I will hand it back over to Anya. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Mamatas. This is super inspiring. I'm really excited to create a map of uh, San Francisco parks as well, uh, as we're seeing more leaves around the city. Um, and uh, now I am really excited to start our customer panel where um, a couple of power users uh, who um, demonstrated so many beautiful maps created in felt will share um, some tips and tricks and like the process behind their maps. Um, and I really want to uh, uh, start with uh, Josh, uh, who is a right and editor at bikepacking.com. And he'll share a map that he recently used for his trip around Europe. Josh. Hey, uh, I'm Josh. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak here. Uh, um, yeah, let me share my screen. Um, so for geographic context, this is in the Dolomite Mountains in Europe. I'm just going to zoom out. So this is where we are. And uh, I created this map with friends for, oops, to plan a trip basically a bike trip. And uh, the reasons were basically twofold, one to plan a trip concretely, but also kind of just curiosity on my part, like how would using felt, this was in June, so felt had just been released, how it felt change the experience of both the trip planning and, and also like during the trip itself, like navigation potentially. Um, so we we're four people with slightly complex logistics with start and end times. Uh, not really lining up, so we're kind of converging on the region at different times. We kind of had to get on the same page with what kind of bikes are we bringing, uh, where are we sleeping, um, what's our general mode, like what's our what's our general idea before we before we leave. Like we don't want to we want to arrive back home as friends, basically, and not everyone on their own. Um, right. So I'll just mark like a few highlights here. Um, we used emojis like pins to, to mark uh, arrival points. So here in, in Brixen on the 16th of June, that's where a few of us would arrive while Brittany would be coming in. One of the riders would be coming in from Slovenia. So she put her own GPX route here on the right hand side. And then kind of like a, a transfer path she might take to meet us somewhere, somewhere in the middle. I mean, got a highlighter, so it's somewhere here we would meet up. All these other lines are um, GPX files, so routes we would call them, uh, of existing events or previous rides we'd done in the area. And the idea was kind of that, uh, like we didn't really want to uh, single out one route a priori, but rather just kind of uh, have a good time and, and drift through the area. So having multiple routes was like absolute game changer, really. That's not really been possible with, with common 
cycling route planners up until now. Um, yeah, so on the one hand, you have the multimedia aspect, pictures, pins, and routes. That was really key. And also the collaborative uh, aspect. It's just super fun, actually, and not frustrating whatsoever. Before this, um, before fell, planning would always be like bouncing back and forth between some kind of a chat group, uh, different links posted in the chat group to single routes that you kind of have to like load into your working memory and then overlay in your head and, and then kind of figure out like what's the difference do like a mental diff operation just absolutely insane and then like go back to maybe a text document or something for more detailed information is absolutely bonkers really so having that all in felt was super nice you can see down here on the bottom there's you know just some key points uh, about what we what we we're thinking so bivy bags only no tents maybe a hotel like this is just kind of Getting, getting on the same page. Um, gear that we're maybe sharing and coffee, of course, like coffee gear. And then a few lists, uh, a few links to maybe nice, nice to have uh, information. But the main point is really all these routes here, the multitude of routes was, was really key. Um, so moving down like along the user journey let's say so we were in planning the the, pre, the first part and you get to the actual trip we didn't actually use the map as much as i thought we might which could come down to different could come down to different reasons we didn't use it for navigation purposes or checking out options that could also be a good thing like maybe we we were already having put in the work we were already on the same page so we didn't need to reference it as much or just because we're not used to it as a group. Um, or maybe we kind of just dissipated our, our planning urges kind of, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Josh. This is really impressive. Um, I really love that, you know, the collaborative aspect was so, um, uh, was so relevant to, um, to this specific use case. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely key. And I can imagine like lots more use cases really as a, you could use it as a documentation tool. So planning, navigation, and, and then documentation after the fact or storytelling. You can all imagine, imagine those use cases along the user journey. Awesome. Um, well, um, let's, um, let's see if you, if you want to see Josh's map um, or uh, more just examples of this specific use case, uh, you can uh, always look up in our Slack group. We have a whole channel for different maps. It's called uh, show off your map. You can also share your map in that um, in that little uh, channel and um, just kind of uh, show what you created and felt. And then um, I want to pass the mic to Lynn, who is our uh, who is um, our user who who is running a Substack publication uh, called Parachute, and it's dedicated to climate solutions. Lynn, hi, thanks. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. It's probably important for me to note before I get started that um, I'm very much a mapping novice. I'm going to sound like a felt commercial, but I promise this is not sponsored. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm I'm very much a mapping novice to the extent that my friends actually joke that, um, like, I'm a liability whenever we try to go anywhere or do anything. And a few months ago, I left my full-time job to um, travel full-time and uh, do research on climate solutions. Um, and all my friends were really nervous about it, but felt kind of it got me through the process. Um, we used my my team and my co-founder and I, we actually used felt um, in the planning process and the actual travel process. We've used it for note taking and we are actually like now um, we've collected a bunch of qualitative and quantitative data along the way. And now we're like sort of retroactively populating a lot of that into our map. So you can sort of see um, all of the cities that we either like planned or did visit for parachute. Uh, we sort of do the research in sets that we call seasons. And so um, originally all of these were just like the red dots. And now um, as we went through cities, you know, we sort of were able to click them off. Um, so we went to like 12 or 13 cities, I think. Some of them are uh, like overlap, but we went to 12 or 13 cities over the last um, two months as a team. And 
So I just want to pull up Miami as an example. So, um, you know, like first we like use this to select and figure out what cities we were going to go to and then, you know, who should go where in what order, um, because I could not tell you what you know, side of the country St. Louis is on before I started using this. So this was really helpful for that. Um, but in terms of the actual like note taking, um, you can see that like we collected a lot of like photos and images. Um, for example, here's one. This is a drone image that was taken in the little Haiti neighborhood in Miami. Um, Miami is actually separated by railroad tracks, which seems like almost too much of a fictional trope. Um, but when you click on it, you can actually see that on one side, um, you have this neighborhood, little Haiti, that's really paved over very, um, you know, like uh, industrial, um, kind of disinvested. And then you have on this side, morning side, um, and the railroad tracks separate them. If you were to try to, go like get across the railroad tracks like let's say here it would take you 50 minutes to walk like back or forth um I tried mapping it so it's really crazy how the neighborhoods are really separated and the property values are also really different so on the morning side um side of it the average property value is around two 2.25 million and um on the little Haiti side you get like 539k so it was just really interesting being able to visualize and then you can see actually that like so morning side is on the beach side here um and then we did stuff like data collection where you know one of the basic climate solutions is actually different types of shading structures for extreme heat and so um i would take photos of different shading structures that i really liked um and show just because like part of this is showing how um solutions can make our communities more beautiful but also understanding that they are effective so under this shading structure, which mostly looks decorative, we actually saw a 13 degree difference in temperature, 13 degree Fahrenheit difference in temperature. And I was able to record that in the felt map um, and attach that information to the image. And then, you know, all of these different cities have a bunch of resources, but I like to pick sort of my favorite resource and link it to that city. So this is the Resilient 305, 305 is their area code. So Resilient 305 is the um, like uh, climate strategy that Miami and Miami-Dade County has. And then I had a quick sort of high level, I, you know, thoughts taking or takeaways, takeaways and findings um, from my trip to Miami. So, and now uh, we've got a bunch of uh, data. For example, we were carrying around air quality, temperature and humidity monitors. Uh, that's all spatial data. And so we're going to be populating that afterwards as well as um, qualitative data that we have from interviews. So that's, uh, that's my map. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lynn. I really love how, um, you know, it just uh, documents a lot of um, a lot of travel notes and just, you know, the way you document it is really cool. Uh, well, and um, our next speaker is Alex, who is um, uh, documenting uh, parcel data in Detroit and also um, uh, runs a Substack publication as well. So, uh, Alex, please take a, take it away. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for for having me here. I'll uh, get my screen share going. Can everybody see that? Okay. Okay. So uh, I, I'm the vice president of research and development at a company called uh, Regrid. Uh, we're a uh, parcel data uh, company. The parcel data is speaking to the um, legal property boundaries. Uh, of property and then the underlying assessment information on who owns those properties, what they're assessed at, how they're taxed, what they're zoned for, uh, so on and so forth. And so we've collected a, a we've, we've created and uh, maintain a national um, database of, of just about every property in the country. I think there's only about 20 or 30 counties for which we don't have uh, parcel data. Um, and uh, and we license that data, and and uh, and I run a program at Regrid called uh, Data with Purpose that makes that data available for researchers and academics and nonprofits uh, who want to use it. Um, and and while our data is is national in scope, uh, I live in Detroit. I've uh, been here for about twelve years and do a lot of uh, work tracking um, uh, phenomenon in in uh, in Detroit property using uh, Regrid's data. And so we have a platform where you can, you know, use our parcel data, introduce your own data sets, look for intersections um, between, you know, lo lots of different data sets. And, and I do a lot of analytical work and research um, in uh, the Regrid software. And, and then at the end of that, 
you know, I'll typically export the product of my analysis or create a map that I take, you know, a screenshot of or something like that. And when, uh, you know, when I, when I was uh, introduced uh, to felt uh, by a colleague of mine and saw the upload anything feature, I was really excited because uh, uploading um, the results of uh, my analytical work in, uh, in regrid and being able to work with parcel shapes is, is what I really love to do. Um, and, uh, and it's been a great, uh, a great tool. And so the, the sort of, you know, little, little demo that I, I put together here was using regrid data to identify um, based on um, our property tax bill mailing address data, um, Detroit properties that are owned by somebody in Florida. And so, you know, across a lot of the country, we have data on um, where uh, a property's property tax bill is mailed, which is not always to the, you know, property itself. Um, and uh, uh, there's quite a lot of out-of-state ownership of Detroit property that's come through, you know, speculative um, uh, activity over the last few years and the largest number of non-Detroit properties, um, or, or, you know, uh, I should say the largest number of uh, properties owned out of state um, in Detroit are represented by owners in Florida. And so this, this map, um, I'll, I'll zoom in here a little bit. Uh, you know, uses the upload anything feature. Um, you're you're able from regrid to export shape files or KML files of your you know analytical work. So I I did that to isolate you know uh, uh, Detroit properties with um, Florida tax bill mailing addresses. Drop that into Felt, um, and it popped up beautifully. Um, so you can click on any of the parcels in here, see all of the underlying assessment information that regrid has for the property. I've not gone through to kind of like clarify what each and every one of these uh, assessment data points uh, relates to, but the, the properties are uh, labeled by which city in Florida uh, the property tax bill um, is, is mailed to. Uh, you can click on uh, properties to see, uh, you know, I have a couple of examples of like what, what these houses look like. You can see I've, you know, outlined a neighborhood where the, the largest concentration of Florida ownership um, sits. Um, and then uh, there's a little background on the map over here, a link to my Substack where I write up um, uh, stuff like this. I've, I've written a little bit about out-of-state ownership of Detroit properties. And then if you go all the way down here to South Florida, my little uh, money bag icons represent the um, top seven addresses uh, to which um, uh, Detroit properties owned by somebody in Florida have their property tax bill mailed. And so you can see the kind of odd storefronts, uh, faceless office parks and things like that, where, you know, 30% of the about 4,000 Detroit properties owned by somebody in Florida have their, um, their tax bill mailed. So there's, you know, a couple hundred properties uh, uh, where the, the tax bill is mailed to one of these, uh, you know, seven addresses. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Alex. This is fascinating. I um, it's actually the number of um, like detail, the detail, and also research that you did. It's really, truly really fascinating. Thank you so much. And um, our next speaker is uh, a GIS analyst and um, environmental science expert, Chris, who also um, created a couple of fascinating maps with our data upload feature. Uh, Chris, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Anna. Let me share my screen. So with, with maps, I often like to tell a story and guide the user as to an outcome or to have them get a better understanding of an area based on the story I'm trying to tell and also what the underlying data is. So what I was looking at was the crop data by the USDA, they have this giant map of the whole country, and it's it's an image, it's a raster, a geotiff. And every every type of crop, or if it's you know, urban or shrubland or whatever, it has a number value. And but it's an image, geotiff. So I needed to convert that over to a vector based type of information for that felt could use, and I can color code it and everything. So what I first did was download the whole country, and then using Python and some libraries, Rasterio, GeoPandas, they're good for slicing and dicing, raster imagery, and also adding attributes to things, especially the, uh, 
title, what kind of crop it is, the actual name, so people could understand it rather than the number. So then once I had that in there as a GeoJSON, I just brought it in and did the upload into Felt and then brought it in. And one, some of the great tools are the, the advanced styling. And for this, I was using, I wanted to have unique colors for everything. So I just, you know, these are all the crops and then all these unique values. And what I did is on a, there's a website where they have the, the hex bin or the RGB values. And, and you can just say, I want 200 different unique colors and you can just copy that. And then I pasted it right into the advanced styler and felt. And so I was able to have unique colors and right out of the gate and I was able to look at things. So with this map, if you click on a part of the map, you can see you can see what the crop is. You have walnuts being grown there. And then I think these are, uh, I think that a lot of the brown is almonds. It's almonds is all over the, this valley in California. And then these purple areas are grapes. So if you zoom out and you can see where the grape growing, the vineyards are of, of the area. And so we can jump over here to this part and you can see there are, there are tomatoes being grown here, cherries and different things. So this is very, tells a compelling story. It's, it's interesting to see. The other thing I wanted to look at was how population of people compared to this map. And so there's this great hex bin map of the whole world and it shows what the population is. And what I did, I, I brought that in and it'll show up here and I can zoom out. And these are population and they're color coded. And this is the Bay Area here. And then you, over here you have Napa, Sonoma. And as people, people who are in the know know that that is, I'll turn that off and turn this back on. The purple areas are grapes. So once that finishes loading, you have, you have big grape areas, Napa, Sonoma so that these are where all the vineyards are. So you can map whatever you want with that. The other thing I did was I wanted to have the towns and cities in here. So I had a CSV file, it's a text file that I downloaded from the state of California and it has the population. So I wanted to have the different labels and the different uh, symbols uh, go to different sizes based on the population of that town or that city. And again, in advanced styler, I used what's called a what's called a filter, and so I was able to specify in here. Let me get the map. I can just say, you know, population over one hundred thousand, give it this value. If it's less than it's between fifty and fifty thousand and one hundred thousand, give it this other value, and so you can slice and dice your data and present it in a nice format that works with people so that they can understand what they're looking at. Makes it really good for looking at things and uh, combining things where you can just quickly jump in and jump out of an area and look at things that you want to see as to what kind of trends you're looking for. And that's what I'm using with uh, felt. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Chris. This is really impressive. I um, I looked at the map, but I didn't really notice vineyards at first. So it's it's super cool. Um, and uh, um, now I really want to introduce um, everyone to um, David, who created a really um, fascinating map of um, Airbus supply chain. Um, David, please um, tell us about your map. All right. Thank you, Anna. Yes, so I have a, a map on the Airbus supply chain. I write a uh, Substack as well, uh, that's mixed media. So I was looking for like a map tool that helped kind of understand manufacturing and supply chain uh, for my audience. And so that was what brought me to, to felt. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, a variety of locations where 
Uh, to make an airplane, it requires a lot of different components from around the world. Uh, I kind of try to map out some of the major uh, factories and um, places where certain you know, critical components are made and then how they get all brought together. So um, in this case, there's parts shipped by boat. So the routes are in, are in purple that are boat routes. Um, the airplane routes are in blue and I'll go into that in a second. And then truck routes are in, are in green. Um, primarily Airbus operates in, in France, but also major operations in Germany and Spain and the UK. Um, but in here, there's like some really cool things uh, that, uh, excuse me, that I wanted to uh, like share with uh, the audience. And, and one of those, um, some of the components are really, there's an airplane that's so big, you fit another airplane inside it. It's called, uh, what Airbus calls it is the Bluga. And that's right, if I can zoom in here. Um, oops. In here, um, there's this uh, Beluga airplane and inside it, they put the wings uh, completely inside that. They can, I think they can fit three or four in there. And then they fly that to uh, Germany or to France for final assembly. But um, so that's one of many things. Um, then there's also just how you fabricate an airplane and all the various components. Oh, so I think I zoomed into too much here. Um, and so just going through that supply chain, you'll, you'll notice a variety of things uh, with how the aircraft's assembled. Uh, you'll bring the video. So if you wanna do an interactive tour, um, a lot of this stuff is like hard to kind of get access to or understand without visualizing it. You can tell someone you make something, but until you actually see the process kind of firsthand, you don't fully understand it. So I really wanted to bring that to life in this map. And then as we you know, zoom out even further um, and we think about what's happening in the world, um, all these parts come from around the world. So uh, one of the components has to go through the, the Suez Canal. And one of those things, uh, the Evergrande, if you recall a year or so ago, got stuck in there. So that blocked all this uh, global trade that was coming through the canal um, and, and certainly affected the Airbus supply chain. So as I go forward and, and make some, some additional maps here in the future, going to go into an understanding uh, supply chain risk and how that affects some of the products that we all use every day and how uh, things get made. So that's where I'm going next. Thank you. Sorry, I was doing a lot of zooming. I think it's, uh, yeah. We'll no that. worries. Thank you so much, David. This is fascinating. I really um, love this kind of um, explanatory journalism part of it because uh, I agree it's really hard to understand if you don't have a visual. Um, and with that, I, I mean, I'm so grateful to everyone who uh, showed their maps today. Um, and we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, uh, Rachel, uh, do you, would you like to start our Q&A session? Yes, I would love to. So um, I have a bunch of questions that are up here on the board um, coming in. I want to say we only have five minutes for Q&A, but we'll be answering questions in Slack. So you still have time to add um, to our board here. The link for the map is in the chat. Um, so Mama thought, question number one, will Felt develop a gallery or other create, creator discovery tools? Yes, um, we do have uh, that kind of um, community gallery and discovery tools on the roadmap and the team's hard, hard at work on it. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, the velocity our team works at has been quite fast. So um, it's exciting to see when these things will land. So uh, the future, uh, so this is a feature request for a more structured tutorial and walkthrough of a map. Got it. We will take that into consideration. Um, and also I should plug that Mammoth has been dropping a lot of tutorials in um, the community. So please uh, check out what we have there too in the near term. Um, all right, let me go to how do I, how to style a map in your brand's colors. I'll stop sharing and maybe you can show Mamatha. Yeah, so uh, I think just kind of like we saw on, um, sorry, let me get my map open here. Uh, just like we saw on Chris's map that he was showing how he, colored all of the um, different land use colors in a custom way. 
so you can do that through the advanced uh, style editor. So if you open up the, you can go directly to advanced styling and here you have all of the colors listed that are being um, assigned to each one of the categories here. So you can just put in your uh, brand colors here and uh, that's a quick way to put your brand colors in for your map. Does awesome. that answer the question? <laughs> yes, I believe so. Um, okay, I'm curious um, for the person who asked about 3D capabilities, um, would you mind unmuting and telling us a little bit more what you're looking for? All right, that's me. Sorry, I'm trying to juggle multiple calls coming in and then this. Um, actually, for uh, architectural visualization, um, especially because felt with the collaborative aspect and how user friendly it is, right? That's more approachable to having, I guess you could say, the average person who's not really familiar with that uh, come in and help map making, especially with community outreach, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, 3D models like so. So kind of approaching it from what like SketchUp would be used for with model import, except onto a more user-friendly, aesthetically pleasing um, community outreach purpose with a map. So just importing quick models of like new developments, right? Even just basic 3D shapes or 3D models. So not nothing super high poly count, nothing like that. Just even basic uh, for scaling and massing, right? So mm -hmm. that's kind of the... The idea just that was going on in my, my head and a few few of my colleagues who uh, are working on different projects were like, ooh, felt is because I I've got us all on the felt and everybody loves it for the user friendly aspect. But then it's like, OK, well, we want some, some 3D stuff. So we're just kind of curious about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, this was really helpful. And oh, send us uh, your your long feature wish list, um, and and we'll we'll put it um, in front of the team to prioritize. Um, and I would ask that the programmatic API and or SDK person, do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you're looking for specifically? Sure, that's absolutely that's me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I um, all my uh, blog and and stuff is all programmatic. I, that's how I generated it all. Um, and then just being able to manipulate my map through APIs is just going to speed my time for, for developing my, uh, the content I create. And so anything, anything on that, I know you have some good upload tools and that stuff all works great. Uh, but as things change or I want to add, remove things or change things around, manipulate things, just anything programmatic really helps uh, me personally, uh, you know, speed that up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, that is great to hear. And we are hard at work on these types of features. So that is great. Um, there are a few more, but I know we're one minute past and I want to get everyone out of here. We'll be following up on Slack with some of these, but what an amazing event. Um, I just want to say thank you, Anya, for, for bringing us all together and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, well, thank you uh, to everyone who joined us today and everyone who sh shared their maps. Uh, we're going to host more events uh, in the near future, and uh, we're going to uh, also host a Halloween uh, mapping challenge. So if you're interested in uh, that, please join our Slack community. We are always um, sharing a lot of maps and uh, tips and tricks from Mamata, your interest in da data sources. So uh, let's stay in touch, and I will also be sending uh, a recording of this meeting so you can refer back to it or share it with your team um, over email uh, to everyone who attended. Thank you so much, uh, and we're going to see you on the internet. <laughs>